I'm uncomfortable because it's an uncomfortable topic. It's scary as hell. It's the stepping stone to what else can my governor choose for me and my body. It's it's an open door to that. It's not a stepping stone. Bitch, I got problems or 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 problems that my governor can choose for my body. And this is exactly what, this is exactly what I was talking about in my rant a few days ago about informed consent. It, it's implied that she doesn't have the capability of consenting to something for her own body. It is implied that other people know what's best for her in birth and that other people are going to ensure the safety of her baby better than she is. And that it matters more than the safety and well-being of her. That's what I should have said at the beginning. <laughs> that's how I should have introed this whole thing. Because that's what pisses me off so hard. Is this is an open door to other people making decisions for women about their own shit. It's not up to anybody else to make these decisions. If you want to save babies, if you want to improve the system, if you want to improve the outcome for children, do something about smoking, do something about schools, do something about food, do something about paid maternity leave. I'm going there. Do something about mental health support in the U.S. Freaking childcare. Do something about so many cracks that these kids can slip through and these mothers can slip through when they're trying their hardest to get it done. Do something about that. Don't take away and decide that your, your decision is more important than her decision or is better or righter than her decision. That's not where you save babies. That's where you fail women and fail families. That's why I should have said. That's the beginning. Now let's talk. Hey, <laughs> it's working and I'm live. Hello, thanks for hanging out with me today. You are watching this live in the group All About Birth or What Comes Next, or you're seeing this on YouTube in the replay and I'm seeing people pop up. I'm so glad you're here with me this weekend. I am Mandy, I'm the birth nurse. I help busy people, people birth boldly. I'm a labor and delivery nurse, founder of Birth Nurse Academy. I teach online. Um, nurses and their birth professionals. And I am in my office, in my cozy jungle, about to rant. This is a rant. This is my personal rant. So you are in the right place if you just want to <laughs> hear what I have to say. But if you're feeling particularly sensitive, um, this isn't the rant for you. Also explicit um, warning. So put in earplugs. I'm just going to say that. I don't really know what's going to happen, but um, I have a few things to talk about. I'm not going to talk about everything. And surprisingly enough, this is not a, um, I'm not going to try to talk you into anything. Like I don't care if you agree with me, not at all. I think that it is wise for everyone, for ourselves to listen to people that we do and don't agree with. So welcome. If you don't agree with me, I really welcome your comments. If you do agree with me, I welcome your comments. What are you thinking? Where are you at right now? Say hello. Let me know if you can hear me. And I need to um, also give a shout out to Teamy Blends before I get really going and heated and forget to do this. I'm drinking tea today from Teamy. They sent me this really cute tumbler because I needed more tea and less coffee in my life. And this is the skinny tea. It helps give me some energy and helps me snack less in the afternoon. And I'm drinking it this morning because I need a little extra. Um, I think I'm getting a cold. But if you want to feel like energized, like you need less snacks or you want to make more milk, check out the Teamy Blends at teamyblend.com and you can use my code Mandy10. All right. So thanks guys for saying hello and letting know, letting me know you can hear me. First, um, this, is, this came out of, well, it's a need. Like um, this is a really hot topic right now. Obviously Alabama just passed the strictest um, anti-abortion law um, and their goal is to take it to the Supreme Court and overturn Roe v. Wade, 
which was the law passed in, I believe, 1973 that protected women's rights to privacy and therefore an abortion if they choose to with their own bodies. So that is why this, my discussion is just covering like pretty much Roe v. Wade. I don't really particularly want to need to go specifically into Alabama because Alabama is not the goal. The goal is a national reform of the law um, by the Supreme Court. So their goal is to eventually get the Supreme Court to rerule and overturn Roe v. Wade, which affects everyone. So if you're sitting here and you're like, I don't know, I like Mandy's new haircut. I like her jungle. I'm drinking my tea. Like, what else am I going to do today? This doesn't affect me. Or maybe I have a penis. This doesn't affect me. Or maybe I'm Beyond having babies, this doesn't affect me. No, this is a topic that affects everyone. And I made it very clear in a few posts the other day. This is a topic that affects you and affects everyone that you know. And if it hasn't yet, that's great. Or you're not looking. But this is a topic that affects every single person. And I know I have people here. Tell me where you're watching from. I know I have people here that are not in the U.S. that are greatly affected by this topic. So why is that? It has nothing to do with their laws in their country because it's a human rights topic and it's something that we're all um, affected by and should be interested in even though I've been trying really hard to put my head in the sand and deny that it is going to be something I have to talk about. <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> uh, I talk about it all the time just not on social media just not publicly with you guys because it's very political and I don't want to be very political. I'm I'm all about the birthing person choosing that making their own choices for their own body and being supported that way. So, uh, you can guess where this is going, but I hate the incest rape clause. Let's just, that is the craziest fucking part of this whole discussion. And when my husband poked the bear the other day, we were in the car together for a very long period of time trying to get out of a concert. We were stuck in traffic. And he was like, what's your rant going to be? And I was like, I don't know. I think I'm going to skip it this week. I have so much to do. We have so much going on. I'm like, you can only rant so much. And I rant all the time in my life. Like the girls at work know this. I'm always, always going off about something. But he poked the bear and he started talking to me about this topic. And I started crying. I started yelling. I, I like rolled down the windows. I was like, get me out of here. I don't, I can't. And he was like, oh, maybe you should rant about that. Because the incest rape clause is, no one's ready for this clause. And the fact that Alabama has the strictest law, um, which doesn't um, qualify rape or incest as anything different, um, they say, the law says that um, no one is allowed to have an abortion and everyone who um, helps someone have an abortion can be, um, can, is going to go to jail. They don't account for rape and incest, which doesn't matter because it's freaking ridiculous. Um, it shouldn't account for rape or incest because then the state, the governor is essentially saying, I see that there's a place for abortion. I see that there's a place for termination of pregnancy. I'm going to choose, and it's going to be this, this, and this reason. And in other states, like I think Ohio, um, I think Louisiana, they have these clauses. So let's look into the clause. I think what's happening um, is, I know what's happening. There's a lot of discussion about this, and it's a very heated topic, and people are very passionate about it. It's very personal. Even if it's not personal, you can still have a lot of feelings about it. That's fine. Um, even if you have a penis, <laughs> you should have a lot of feelings about this. So I think digging deep into it, this is what comes up for me personally. This is not anyone else's ideas. This is what comes up for me personally is that um, the states are not ready. <laughs> They're not ready for the truth. The states, the states are really not ready to hear how many women actually conceive from unwanted sex or unwanted pregnancies? How many people actually have pregnancies from assault is what I'm trying to say. You know, I have my notes. You know my notes were a problem last week. Bear with me. So 
are they really ready to know those numbers for their own state? No, they're not. Because if they require a disclosure, so what the rape and incest clause says is that if um, the pregnancy is a product of a rape or incest, then the provider may perform an abortion if the if the woman, and I'm just going to use woman today, if the woman um, chooses, which means they have to go to their clinic and disclose that they had an assault. And <laughs> then what happens is it's imperative that the state or the provider, or whomever they have to tell and disclose and sign a form that says this was an assault, this was a pregnancy by assault, they have to be believed. What the fuck? We already know how that works. Didn't we just have this international, um, this international debate about whether a woman was or was not assaulted? by a very high figure male? Didn't we just debate that? That's ridiculous. So is the state ready to believe everyone that comes forward and says my pregnancy was a result of an assault? No, I don't think that that's what that clause says. Oh yeah, and in some cases it requires a police report. So that's totally separate. Not only do they have to be believed, they have to go through, you know, all these steps, which of course is another example of why it's a punishment to be pregnant. Um, <clears throat> and it is considered a punishment to be pregnant, but it requires that she discloses, which is no one's business. It shouldn't be a requirement. But if you're setting up, if you're setting this up, are you setting up a system that makes it possible and that makes it safe? So thank you, Annie. I'm so glad you're here because I'm going to forget some words. Um, did I already say that these were my opinions? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, all of the providers, are all of the providers in the state with the scope and skills to perform a termination going to go through state manda mandated trauma-informed training? Because now they're only going to be working with people. Well, they're going to be doing, you know, the pregnancy gamut. But when they get clients in that, want to terminate the pregnancy, they're going to be dealing with only assault survivors. So are they ready for that? Have they been trained? So it should be state mandated that they are safe and not um, hurt when they uh, seek treatment. Um, are they taught how to have these discussions, how to ask questions in a non-threatening way so as to not sound or act punitively, disrespectful or blaming? No. Of course not. That's not what this law is going to be about. It's not going to be about, oh, let's put a bunch of money to make sure that um, the people that come forward are safe and have dignity and respect. Um, that includes their entire staff. So anyone who comes in contact with these women needs to have the training in order to ensure that she is safe and respected. How about their duty to provide a refer out in order to get required follow-up care? Is there access to care? It's not just I'm walking in and I want to terminate my pregnancy. Now it's I'm walking in and I'm reporting a rape. What are they? So they're going to do STD screenings? Are they going to do mental health screenings? I mean, they usually do STD screenings, but do they refer out to um, mental health, like trained professionals? that work with assault survivors? Are there enough of them? Do the providers know about them? Are they ready for the onslaught, the numbers that are gonna be coming? What about legal ramifications? So all of these things are like swirling in my head when I'm reading in the news and I'm putting my head in the sand and I'm <laughs> like, I'm not gonna talk about that. Because it's just, it's huge and you know it's huge, but getting and digging deeper is our responsibility if we are saying no as voters it's our decision it's our decision what these women do so you have to dig deeper and you have to think about the system so in each state if roe v wade is overturned in each state what are the legal ramifications once survivors are forced to disclose to end their pregnancy from assault what happens okay so follow me on this journey if you're super triggery today turn it off Follow me on this journey um, and labor nurses or um, clinic nurses, let me know if you're here. Um, what happens when a 13-year-old discloses that the man, the 13-year-old is in your office or in, in an office for um, requesting a termination for assault? 
and she discloses to you because you've taken training and she's alone in your office um, and you're sitting down and asking her these personal questions slowly and carefully and quietly. She discloses to you that the man who drove her to the clinic for birth control pills, that's what she told him, is her molester and therefore fathered her fetus. And by fetus, I'm using the correct terminology for um, human inside the womb. So he is her, insert the first adult male figure that pops into your head. He's her uncle, brother, father, stepfather, mother's boyfriend, pastor, friend's dad, whomever he is. Now he has been um, accused of assaulting and impregnating a 13-year-old. What the fuck happens after that? What happens now? Are there police on site to arrest him? No. Of course not. Does the clinic report it to Child Protective Services? She's 13. How can the governor ensure that she's safe after she discloses? Um, what's the system that's put into place every day for that? So that's going to happen every single day. And there are numbers to this. And pregnancy out of assault is actually common. I mean, it's... It, they used to think that you couldn't get pregnant from rape, and we know that that's scientifically ridiculous. So from our trial and error healthcare system, once we try this and all of these like questions and problems pop up, isn't it a believing her argument? So then if it gets really, really sticky and all of these people start coming forward and saying, no, I still want an abortion or I still want a termination. I still need to end this pregnancy for my health, my safety, my sanity. Um, and yes, this pregnancy was a product of a rape or incest. Five, 10 disclosures a day. I mean, how many would it take to be a lot? All of, There's no way all of these people had and assault from this, had pregnancies from assault. There's no way that the state would believe all of these women. So naturally, who, how are you going to determine who's being truthful? How are you going to discover the truth? Will the state conduct an immediate investigation? That's a lot of manpower and a lot of money. Will they conduct a trial right then before she reaches the time where she can't terminate anymore? Because of course there's going to be a deadline in these laws, right? No. Can you imagine that? Like a rush trial to determine to get DNA from the fetus or do a whole rape kit at the, at the scene. Or, um, really, it gets fuzzy. It gets really weird and fuzzy and sticky and uncomfortable and horrible. Okay. So if all that becomes a system for terminating pregnancy, either she'll disclose this 13-year-old, will disclose and face consequences from her abuser and or her family, possibly the same people, her community, anyone that finds out, or she won't because who wants to go through that, right? You either decide, yes, it's worth it, or no, it's not. If it's not worth it for her, that must be the goal if you're making it so difficult, if the state is making it so horrifically difficult and embarrassing and hurtful and possibly worse. She has no idea what it would be like. She has to weigh those options. The 13 year old girl impregnated by an adult family member carries her baby to term or near term. Near term, I say, because she's a high risk pregnancy because she's a teenager. High risk for preeclampsia, preterm birth, low birth weight, anemia, poor nutrition. Also, assault, you're more likely to um, face domestic violence during pregnancy and die. One more way a perpetrator can have control over someone. So she carries this baby until viability, beyond viability. This baby, this fetus is born, becomes a baby. She decided to, this is just um, an example I made up. I don't know this person. She's decided to terminate her pregnancy she, or she wanted to terminate her pregnancy, not because she didn't think she was going to love this baby. So the idea that we're saving babies, of course she would, she would do anything. She's trying to save herself. It's not that she is incapable of loving her baby. Um, 
she would have an attachment. She has been pregnant with this child. She's going to have an attachment, some sort of attachment, either during pregnancy, it could be unhealthy attachment, but during the pregnancy or during the birth. And now this family member potentially assaulted this child will have potentially continues a tangible and legal connection to her for as long as this child lives, right? Because the father of the baby. So there is a legal connection to rights to that baby. So that is just one more connection and link to her abuser and also um, pawn, you know, like way to control her because threatening and risking that baby's life or taking the baby away or, I mean, those risks are real and they do happen. Okay, so this does affect people who are not raped um, or did not um, experience incest. And then um, birth control always comes up because if you're talking about preventing unwanted pregnancies or having them, but right now it's having them and then um, punishing the the woman and punishing her body by um, forcing her to continue the pregnancy to term or whatever happens to her or the fetus during the pregnancy, Um, which, you know, I have to say because of our maternal morbidity, you know, like it's not the safest thing to have a baby in the U S. If there are so many options, Oh, this just gets me. There's so many options to birth control. Only one or maybe two, if you count a few, are um, are for the man. So <laughs> if all but one option is the female's responsibility, but sh- then she's the one with the consequence of carrying a baby to term, where's his consequence? Will there be re- legal ramifications for as I've read on multiple sites, news sites, social media posts, people that I know, if they're can if they're um, the, a man and a woman are having are participating in irresponsible behavior, which is what I've read, um, where's his legal ramification? If this is if we're talking equal rights, then should he be legally held accountable? for creating a baby that they did not want or that she did not want. All these questions are swarming in my head and now they're all in my notes and now they're all in your ear. But this is what I think about when I hear all this stuff. It's, there's so much more to it. There's so much more to it. And it's not, I mean, you guys know my work. You know that I'm not, I'm not, about hurting people. (laughs) I'm not, I'm not about hurting people. But when I hear, when I hear that abortion is going to protect baby, when I hear that making it illegal to have an abortion is going to protect babies, I question how is it really going to protect babies? How is it going to protect or improve our society? It's not a fix for sex trafficking. We know that. T. So what's going to happen when those fetuses are born? <clears throat> what's going to happen after birth for sex traffickers? If they don't want a baby, who's going to take those children? What's the plan? What's the system? I want to know these answers when it seems black and white. It's not. It seems easy, but there's a whole lifetime of consequence to this. And it doesn't necessarily mean good or bad consequence. Every action has their consequence. That's what we teach our four-year-old. So what is the system that's in place? Do those children go to their father? If the woman says, no, I want to terminate this pregnancy. I don't want to carry a baby to term. I don't want to have this baby. Does it go to the father who apparently does choose to have the baby? That's why men should be as up in arms as women because what the hell? If it's going to be equal rights, then where's your part in it? Where's that legal ramification? And it's, 
And I've heard people say, well, the state makes you pay um, for the baby. But that, I mean, if you've gone through that process, you know that it all falls on the mother and court proceedings and, oh my gosh, years and years and years of fighting does not make it doesn't, it's not as simple as that. So the children don't go to their father. Um, so is the consequence, I, I can't even go on there. So they find the father. So that, okay, the baby's born. The mother wanted to terminate. At this point now they do a DNA test. They find the father and require him to raise the kids, right? Or they find the father and start um, mandating on his body he's made a child that they did not want because it takes two people. I mean, she can only make a certain number of babies a year in her lifetime. He, I don't even know the numbers. I'm so bad at numbers. He can make what? Infinity? (laughs) I don't know. Probably not, but hundreds a year, right? Um, What is the consequence? Is it then that he is, um, he has a vasectomy? a state mandated vet. No, of course not. That would be ridiculous, right? If the state made him do something with his body, he didn't want to do, that would be ridiculous, right? That would be ridiculous. Or, or wouldn't it be ridiculous if, um, if we considered that, um, someone who has an unwanted pregnancy, someone who does anything that the state doesn't agree with, which is apparently having an unwanted pregnancy. Um, you, they, these states feel like you should um, be penalized by carrying the baby to term. But what if they just considered you severely um, mentally handicapped and then decided to sterilize all severely mentally handicapped people? What about if, um, if the state decided that they valued life, which, yes, it's great. I value life. I think we do because we're alive and procreating. You're in a group about birth. I mean, yeah, I assume we all value life here. But so in advanced forms of cancer, the state would mandate that you anyone that you know, your family, be treated, forced into treatment. I mean, they value your life. So they want you to survive. So they believe that you should take every step necessary to have treatment. Okay, well, that may be something that you already want to do. That's fine. But what if they were like, no, in order to pay for all of the children that are now born into our system that are either have no parents they are poor, they have less resources, then we're going to cut off your treatment at the end of your life and we're going to decide when that is and we're going to have to come up with a time frame of, you know, estimated length of living and then we're going to just say, all right, your treatment is done. Like we can't pay for your treatment. Medicaid does not, Medicare does not pay for your treatment anymore. You cannot get any help with your treatment. We have to use that money and help Um, house these people that are now being born because there's a bunch of them, right? Or um, take care of the mothers um, who, or, you know, or the mothers died in childbirth, or we have to take care of them because they were um, injured in their pregnancy, or, you know, the system is strained. So we're going to use that money and just cut off your cancer treatment because your, your doctor says that you have an estimated amount of living time frame and um we're gonna just decide that you don't get it. Does that make any sense? That's what I think of when I hear this. Truly. That's what I I think, no. I'm gonna decide if I want treatment. I'm gonna decide if I want to cut it off. I'm gonna decide if I want to die now and not continue treatment. You see those movies all the time. They're the ones that you cry at. I cry sob. Oh my gosh. <laughs> He loves his family, but he doesn't want treatment. And like, it's so hard to watch that hard, hard, difficult, difficult, challenging decision. They make that decision about their body. We respect it. They are a life. Seriously? So why can't 
a pregnant person make that decision about her body, about her life? Of course she can. This isn't about human life. (laughs) It's not about right or wrong. It's about how much power do you think your government should have over your body, your sister's body, your daughter's body, your mother's body, and where do we draw the line? Because what this group is about and what my day-to-day work is about is how am I going to ever be able to, or how is that 13-year-old ever going to be able to understand choice and understand that she is in charge of her? She is in charge of her body. She's in charge of keeping her children safe. She is in charge of making life decisions that have consequence. How is she ever going to be that autonomous, powerful, confident person, woman, adult, if there are still some really, really important, potentially life or death, decisions that the government is going to make for her or her uh, abuser essentially is going to make for her, right? Her family member is going to make for her, not for him, but for her. How can she ever get there? If those are taken away right from the beginning, I just, that's what boils my blood because the whole system. We don't think about the whole system. We think about, yes, chocolate or vanilla. I know it's not that easy for you guys when you think about this topic, but it's not that easy for anyone. It's not that easy to just make a law and not have any system set up. I mean, we'd all love these wonderful laws that just fix everything, but this isn't going to fix the system and it's not going to create a better system in and of itself. There's so many other factors that we have to think about. And that is why I hate the incest and rape clause and why it's not, would not work in our country. And it's, even if it's never there, it highlights a lot of what's wrong with the system in our country. Irritates me so much. So it's been half an hour. I appreciate you being here with me. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for the discussion with me and for trusting me not to go cray on this rant. Um, And now Facebook, let's talk. Oh, you can see my other rants here um, from last week and two weeks ago. I would love for you to watch those. If you, if you're feeling super ranty or want to get your blood boiling, then join me there. I will see you in the next video.